Hi, thank you for joining us today for our first webinar. This is a series that focuses on improving immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence workflows. Today's webinar is about troubleshooting IHC and IF background. This will be presented by my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Following the 20-minute presentation, we will have a 10-minute Q&A session. Please submit any questions through the chat function and on the GoToWebinar website. I, I am now pleased to introduce you my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Over to you, Craig. Hey, thanks very much, Byron. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are located globally, and thank you for joining us. I hope you find this webinar informative and certainly helpful, particularly for those of you who are currently struggling with background or that frequently encounter background. So as a bit of an overview, we'll look at what is background for those of you who may be new to the field. We'll look at sources of background you may encounter with immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. And we'll look at methods and strategies to help reduce or hopefully eliminate background. So what is it we refer to when we're talking about background? It's non-specific staining or signal observed on the test specimen. Now this may be observed as a trace or a weak staining, uh, perhaps, possibly as a toning across the section, or maybe just some isolated cells. It may be a little more heavier, a moderate type of expression. And I'd have to say that most investigators would probably face either trace or moderate background expression in their preparations. If they do see a severe background staining, toning, I would say that more than likely there's something fundamentally wrong with the assay setup. Now the background may come from one or more sources. Certainly it might be endogenous or inherent to the tissue specimen. It may arise from the detection reagents, or indeed it may be a combination of both the tissue and the detection reagents. So just to clarify for immunohistochemistry, we're speaking about the oxidized substrate reaction product that's deposited on the tissue specimen. For example, this would be diaminobenzidine staining or DAB staining that you observe in a nonspecific manner. For immunofluorescence, we're referring to visible fluorescence in the same spectral wavelength as the specific detection fluorophore. For example, if you're using or working with a fluorescein or FITC conjugated green fluorophore, you may also see some interfering green fluorescence in that same wavelength. So what are some of the problems arising from background in these applications? Certainly interference with the target or the specific staining you're trying to identify. There could be a lot of confusion with the antigen expression. This leads to false positives. Certainly there may be cells identified that are not specifically supposed to be positive, different cells, different cell types, indeed different cell compartments may stain. Potentially if you're looking for a nuclear antigen, there may also be staining in the cytosolic area. So what this does, it raises questions about your, your assay validation, raises the questions about what is specific, and it does undermine the credibility of your data certainly for publication purposes or anything beyond that. The goal in these applications for immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence are clear, unambiguous views of the target antigen you're looking for. So if you are encountering background, you certainly want to undertake some troubleshooting. And this is a two-step process. You want to identify the source or sources of background and once they've been identified, you want to implement methods specific to the source to overcome the background staining. I'm just going to deviate here a little bit. In my time on technical service, I feel that inquiries from investigators or end users are quite frustrated with their situation. Uh, they say, you know, Craig, last week everything was working great. 
This week, I'm using the same antibody, same tissue block, same detection reagents, and I've got a bunch of background. You know, nothing's changed. What am I doing wrong? You know, take a step back, take a deep breath, and just uh, understand that certainly you're probably working with something like a heterogeneous tissue block. And the further you cut sections into this block, there may be varying degrees of cell type expression, uh, which may have varying levels of antigen expression on them. Uh, indeed, there may be areas of highly vascularized tissue that may introduce erythrocytes in there, bringing in additional peroxidase activity, for example. Or indeed, in some disease models, there may be increased in, in inflammation, which may increase, say, leukocyte infiltration or things like that. Uh, or indeed, there may be areas of necrosis or dead tissue. Now, as you're cutting into these blocks, all of these factors may contribute to background. So you have to be flexible in your approach uh, in, in these methodologies. So let's pivot a little bit just towards the immunohistochemistry workflow at the moment here. It is a series of sequential incubation steps that I've outlined here, steps one through six, in a very simplistic manner. I've highlighted here step number one, the tissue prep, which is really fixation of the prep, and antigen retrieval methodologies. These are more associated with protocol optimization. And at least in my experience, I haven't seen a direct line between these facets for immunohistochemistry and background development. It is a little different for immunofluorescence. Uh, however, again, for immunohistochemistry, this step number one, mostly associated with sensitivity of the assay and reproducibility on a day-to-day -day basis. So my recommendation, the main areas for troubleshooting would be steps two through six. So if you are encountering background, as we mentioned earlier, identify the source of the background. And the idea would be to run your defined deletion controls. And what I've got here is a schematic of a one-step polymer immunohistochemistry detection procedure. So the cartoon here shows primary antibody followed by your enzyme polymer and then reacted with the enzyme substrate. So what this assumes is you've already done the tissue prep antigen retrieval, you're quenching, you're blocking, and then you put on these given detection reagents. So number one is you start with the back of the assay with the color development part. So your first deletion control, again, omitting primary, your secondary detection reagent, you put on just the substrate alone and see if there's any color development. Indeed, if there is staining, it may be due to lack of quenching, possibly inadvertently emitted, uh, it's old reagent or it needs to be further concentrated, or indeed there may be a time issue. Make sure you're also quenching for the appropriate enzyme based on the methodology you're using, if it's peroxidase or alkaline phosphatase. If you do see staining with this first deletion control, uh, the recommendation would be to employ some enzyme quenching methods. And for endogenous peroxidase activity, Usually, hydrogen peroxide is the go-to methodology, diluted either in water or methanol. If you are using highly vascularized tissue, frozen sections, you may want to use methanol uh, just to avoid that bubbling uh, that you may see if you use water that quenches those heme groups quite rapidly uh, and will destroy or, or affect the tissue architecture. There are alternative methods uh, in publications, and certainly there are commercial products such as Bloxol. If you're working with endogenous uh, alkaline phosphatase, or rather C endogenous alkaline phosphatase activity, the use of levamisol up to around five millimolar in the alkaline phosphatase substrate working solution usually takes care of that. Now, it is a reversible inhibitor of alkaline phosphatase activity, and it is put on a different part in the workflow compared with peroxidase. So just uh, remember that when you are applying levamisol. There are other methodologies out there in the literature and certainly some commercial products again, such as Bloxol. So if you've worked through those steps, uh, potentially eliminated 
uh, the background, and you're still seeing some in, uh, now after that first deletion control. Move on to this second deletion control. And I've copied here this cartoon, this diagram again, uh, highlighting our schematic we're working from. What we're assuming is you've done the tissue prep, antigen retrieval, the quenching, the blocking, and you're emitting the primary, but you are applying the enzyme polymer and reacting with the enzyme substrate. If you do see staining under these conditions, more than likely, from my experience, it's going to be due to species cross-reactivity of that secondary detection reagent, either with something inherent in the tissue or the detection reagents, potentially inadequate or inappropriate blocking, or possibly uh, inadequate buffer washes, skimping on those buffer washes. Less likely would be a concentration factor or indeed uh, incubation time or temperature. So just to get into it a little deeper with the species cross-reactivity, you could be facing a scenario of a species-on-species -species application. And what this would be would be, for example, applying a mouse primary antibody on mouse tissue sections. Uh, and, and this certainly would be also in a xenograft model, for example, where you might have human tissue grown up in a mouse uh, and you are using a mouse primary antibody. There are commercial uh, blocking options available, as I've highlighted here on these uh, images on the right-hand side. Uh, and indeed, if you do have flexibility in the approach, instead of using a mouse primary on the mouse tissue, see if you can change it out. Maybe apply a rabbit primary or a goat primary antibody, so you, you, have, you avoid the use of the anti-mouse secondary antibody on that mouse tissue. Uh, if feasible, uh, you could potentially conjugate that primary antibody as well. Uh, certainly for immunohistochemistry directly with an enzyme or biotinylated, followed through with a streptavidin conjugate. And for immunofluorescence, you could conjugate it with a fluorophore. So these, this second deletion control is certainly appropriate and pertinent to the immunofluorescent application as well in workflow. So these uh, take homes uh, are good also for that application. Now, what we have also encountered is closely related species, whereby uh, investigators might be applying a mouse primary on rat tissue, and they're using an anti-mouse secondary antibody that has a certain degree of cross-reactivity with the rat IgG. In these instances, the recommendation would be to use a pre-absorbed reagent, for example, anti-mouse rat-adsorbed secondary antibody. Or indeed, if the cross-reactivity is low, around say three to six percent, uh, the recommendation would be to use serum from the same species as the tissue or the specimen and use that in the buffer to dilute that secondary antibody and absorb up some of that stickiness. Inadequate blocking or inappropriate blocking, just make sure you've got the right serum there. If you're using, say, uh, a goat anti-rabbit secondary antibody, you'd use goat serum. The idea is to use serum from the same species in which that secondary antibody is raised. Uh, if you're using a donkey anti-rabbit, you use donkey serum. Make sure you're not using rabbit serum as a blocking agent with an anti-rabbit secondary antibody that will generate background. Uh, if serum is an issue in your lab, uh, or you want to reduce the use of serum, uh, certainly there are other alternatives. Uh, gelatin has been widely referenced in the literature, and certainly there are some plant-based or animal-free reagents, which double up as universal uh, block and diluent reagents. They're very useful if you're juggling a lot of different sera in the lab. Uh, certainly, you could also consider applying some detergent in the wash buffer, like a, a Tween 20 or a Triton X100 at about 0.1 to 0.5%. Uh, that does prevent hydrophobic interactions. Further with this secondary deletion control, don't skimp on those buffer washes. What I've tried to show here in this uh, diagram, the shorter incubation time, it's easy to skip on that and say, you know what, I, I need to race out to lunch just now take the extra time uh, to do those washes. Uh, on thin cut sections of say four to six microns, use two times five minutes buffer washes, particularly after using a polymer uh, secondary detection reagent. 
If you're working with thicker tissues, something over 10 microns, floating sections, hole mounts, you will have to increase the frequency of the buffer washes and how long you're going to actually do those buffer washes to remove that unbound material. There are certainly some other contributing factors we mentioned. Uh, I did put incubation temperature down here uh, because a colleague from uh, Thailand challenged me on what is it that I'm referring to as room temperature. Uh, certainly in, uh, in the US here, uh, it's around 22 to 24 Celsius, but uh, he reminded me in, in Thailand, um, it's around 32. So just make sure that, that those factors are being controlled at your end. For those of you who may be working with a biotinylated secondary and a streptavidin conjugate, a streptavidin enzyme for immunohistochemistry, a streptavidin fluorophore for immunofluorescence, you will have to run that additional deletion control whereby you're just putting on that streptavidin reagent. Uh, if you are encountering background from uh, that particular deletion control, you may want to investigate whether or not that is inherent or detectable levels of biotin. If so, use a recipe that's published out there or indeed a streptavidin or avidin biotin blocking kit. So once you've worked through those, hopefully you've eliminated the background. If not, put the whole thing together, the whole detection methodology, see if you still get inappropriate or non-specific staining. If it does, cast an eye toward that primary antibody. Uh, you know, is it purified? Is it validated uh, from that commercial source? If so, just make sure you're working within those recommended guidelines of dilution, how long it's supposed to be incubated on the tissue prep at the, the temperature and the diluent. Some antibodies respond better to using a TRIS-based buffer compared with a phosphate-based buffer. And just uh, compare this to your positive control tissue, possibly when you're working up that primary antibody. For investigators in the research field, sometimes you might be working with a non-purified primary antibody that derived uh, from an ascites or sera that I've, I've mentioned here, maybe culture media, something like that. Uh, rabbit polyclonal antibodies, uh, primarily you're going to have to run a tighter series on these, a dilution series, and find that optimal dilution to get the, a compromise between the best signal and the lowest noise. Optimize that signal to noise ratio. Dilute this antibody in buffer with either a serum and or a detergent like we mentioned, a, tree, a, a tween or a triton. And one small trick is to dilute that primary antibody in about two to five percent normal serum derived from the same species as the tissue specimen. Let that incubate for about one hour at room temperature prior to putting that on the tissue section. That will absorb out sticky uh, proteins from the sera or ascites it might be derived from. Okay, so let's pivot now towards immunofluorescence. Very similar to immunohistochemistry as you mentioned in that workflow in a very broad sense in the series of sequential incubations. And certainly you may encounter uh, background from the detection reagents, the primary or secondary antibodies, or indeed it may be inherent in the tissue specimen observed as autofluorescence or a combination of both of those components. If you do see background attributed to the detection reagents, run through the defined deletion controls similar that we described just previously for immunohistochemistry. For example, just apply that secondary fluorophore detection reagent. Is there any background? If so, it may be attributed to species cross-reactivity. It may be attributed to inadequate buffer washes, uh, potentially inadequate or inappropriate blocking reagents. And then also look at that primary antibody that we just described as well. Uh, just make sure it's within the right titer and apply it at the same uh, concentration as recommended. So these these are very similar, or these points are very similar to what you would find for the immunohistochemistry that we described before. An area that, that investigators do struggle though uh, with, with, with immunofluorescence that you would not encounter with immunohistochemistry is tissue autofluorescence. And certainly as I've shown here in this image, uh, there are a lot of 
autofluorescent compounds in tissue. Red blood cells are particularly notorious. Various proteins such as collagens, uh, elastins, uh, and certainly you do see autofluorescence induced through the use of an aldehyde fixative such as formalin, formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. Uh, if you do see these, they certainly are not just uh, within the green spectrum that we've shown here, it's across across the, the, the spectrum as well into the red and far red areas. So what we've developed is, is a product called TrueView. Uh, the schematics here show you that in comparison to other products out there such as uh, copper sulfate, some of the ink-based reagents or even homebrew reagents such as sodium borohydride, TrueView certainly does do a great job in quenching fluorescence, autofluorescence from these tissue elements, red blood cells and aldehyde fixatives. One other area of autofluorescence is lipofusion. And I've taken this image from the reference below. Uh, these particular authors did indicate that they were seeing a double false positive due to the presence of lipofusion in their monkey spinal cord tissues. So lipofusion is an accumulation of proteins and lipids, particularly in CNS or uh, brain spinal cord type tissues, in aged type tissues. So if you're working on an Alzheimer's model or Parkinson's, you may encounter lip effusion. If you do, then certainly the ink-based reagents are effective against lip effusion. And I've taken this schematic, this, this image, actually from the Biodium website. Uh, you can see the lip effusion is, is sort of a, a different look to what you might see with an aldehyde fix autofluorescence or other cellular elements, very punctate, cellular specific. Some ink-based reagents are fine, but they tend to induce autofluorescence in the far red channel. Uh, however, Biodium do have a product I've, indi I've indicated here that does work across the spectrum. So if you do encounter autofluorescence, identify the source of that autofluorescence, say through tissue elements or an aldehyde fixative, Look for TrueView. If it is from a lip effusion source, then there are quite a number of ink-based reagents out there that are effective in reducing that. So just to sum up, we do have a, I'd say a plethora of information available on our website, uh, various uh, guides, immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence, some workflows, some troubleshooting guides. Uh, please check those out if you'd like uh, further help uh, in this area. And also, we are just an email away in terms of our technical support. Keep us in mind for our next webinar, August 4th, uh, regarding control sections for immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence applications, why use them, and what is an appropriate control. And at this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I Hopefully, you did find this informative, and I will open it up for Q&A. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Craig, for that formative presentation. We will continue with our Q&A session. The first question is, what is the criteria to choose the normal serum as the blocking agent? Yeah, certainly uh, in most applications where you're using a primary antibody, an unconjugated primary antibody, followed by a secondary antibody, as we indicated in these workflows here and in the in the, the cartoon, maybe an enzyme-based polymer. The idea is that you would use serum derived from the same species in which that secondary antibody is made. So, for example, uh, if you have a rabbit primary antibody and you're using a goat anti-rabbit secondary antibody, you would use normal goat serum as a general blocking reagent. The, the choice of serum uh, really in these applications, it's a relatively cheap source of high protein that will block uh, cellular elements such as FC receptors, uh, macromolecules, charged particles uh, to avoid the detection reagents, either a primary or a secondary antibody, for example, of being bound non-specifically by these elements. So the, the criteria of using that serum, the same species in which the secondary antibody is raised, it's a non-reactive 
material and therefore uh, that's the recommended approach. Uh, as I mentioned, there are alternatives such as an animal-free or a plant-based um, blocking reaction as well, uh, a blocking reagent as well. So certainly uh, there are alternatives out there to serum. Thank you. The next question is about deletion controls. What are you deleting with the second control? I thought the first was deleting the primary antibody and the second deletion is deleting the secondary antibody. Right, so with the schematic uh, we have, um, I had the primary, uh, the secondary, and, and of course the, the enzyme substrate. So the first deletion control uh, would be to apply actually the enzyme substrate. And what we're deleting is the primary and the secondary in, in the schematic that I presented. Uh, potentially, if you're using a two-step methodology, uh, if you have a primary uh, and then a biotinylated secondary and then a say an ABC reagent and the enzyme substrate, you're actually deleting the first three reagents and you're simply applying the enzyme substrate. In the second deletion control I was mentioning, you're actually omitting the primary antibody and you are applying the secondary detection reagent and the enzyme substrate. If you are using a two-step methodology, you're actually omitting the primary and the biotinylated secondary, but putting on your streptavidin conjugate and if you're using an enzyme-based system, uh, the enzyme substrate. Uh, so it depends on the methodology you've got there. So that's the, the first and the second deletion control. And then after that, I said, put everything together and see if you still get inappropriate staining. Uh, and indeed, if you still get inappropriate staining in those uh, with everything together, the primary, the secondary, and the enzyme substrate, but you did not see staining with the first or second deletion control, it tends to indicate something associated with that primary antibody uh, is generating the background, either the diluent possibly or the concentration or something about the antibody that may be recognizing other epitopes beyond that target antigen, antigen that you're looking for. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is about TrueView. Does the TrueView reagent work on any species? Yes, certainly. Uh, the TrueView reagent actually is is really just a couple of chemicals uh, with a buffer. And so they certainly do not differentiate uh, between species. It's not a species-specific kit by any means. Uh, it will work on anything in terms of mammalian tissue uh, and certainly uh, beyond that as well. Uh, it does target uh, the cellular elements that we described. Uh, and in particular, uh, aldehyde based fixatives that do uh, induce this cross-linking uh, and tend to induce autofluorescence across the spectra. So certainly you can use TrueView uh, beyond mammalian tissue, yes. All right, thank you. Next question. For quenching whole mounts, what is your take on using a solution of formamide and hydrogen peroxide? Uh, yeah, it sounds like that that will be then using a detection methodology with an enzyme-based system. You wouldn't wouldn't be using that, of course, for for immunofluorescence. So um, I, I have not run that myself personally. Um, on one of the methodologies that I highlighted there, in terms of references, um, I have used something uh, that in that uses. Um, uh, glucose oxidase, uh, glucose and sodium azide. Uh, it is a very gentle approach and you can let the tissue wallow in that for a period of time uh, and is very effective um, and more gentle, I would say, than potentially uh, what was described there in terms of the, um, the methodology. So I think there might be other alternatives out there um, that sounds a little harsh, particularly for a whole mount, particularly, you know, some of these uh, whole mounts, the xenograph or zebrafish embryos you might be working on are quite thick uh, and you, you want to take a more general approach. Um, so, so just be careful with, with the use of some of those harsher reagents on, on, those, on those preparations.
Okay, great. Uh, what is the difference between true view and true black? Can true black be used to quench all kinds of autofluorescence? Yeah, fair enough. So uh, true black is, is a trade name of a product. It's an ink based reagent from the company Biodium. And uh, at least from our experience, uh, we've seen true black to be effective against lip effusion. True view, on the other hand, uh, does target those cells, uh, cellular elements, the fluorescent proteins we mentioned, collagens, elastins, and autofluorescence induced through use of an aldehyde fixative. And one, uh, excuse me, the, the, the true view is, is superior in quenching those reagents compared to the true black. But I will say true black is superior in quenching lip effusion over true view. Now, uh, we actually do have a recipe where you can actually apply both of those together in the same application or assay if, if you are encountering both uh, tissue autofluorescence from those cellular elements such as red blood cells and lip effusion. And certainly uh, those who are interested, please email us at Technical Service and we can supply that recipe. It was actually worked up by a lab in the UK. Uh, and, and worked very well for them, and we're more than happy to share that information. Okay, great. The next question, are some tissues more problematic than others for background problems? Uh, yes, they are, uh, and that may depend a little bit on the application you're working with. Certainly, tissues, mammalian tissues, such as kidney, liver, uh, such as that, do tend to sequester detectable levels of biotin uh, in, in large amounts. So if you are working with, with an avidin biotin based detection methodology, they are particularly problematic. Uh, you could certainly avoid those by using a polymer-based system. Uh, for immunofluorescence, uh, yes, yeah, some tissues, particularly spleen, uh, are, are particularly problematic, uh, pancreas as well. Um, TrueView does quench. Uh, the reagents, uh, those that autofluorescence under those tissues, but but certainly some tissues tend to be a little more antigenic, I would say, uh, and that would be ex seen mostly with with frozen tissue preps as well, compared with if it was paraffin embedded. Uh, but yeah, certainly some tissues tend to be more problematic. Degrees of vascularization and their and their protein expression that they do have. Yes. Okay, great. Is there a way to remove endogenous prox proxidase coming from macrophages? We see DAB puncta in otherwise perfectly stained tissue. We do quench with we do quench with H2O2. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I uh, the the reference I did mention earlier on there, which which was on the slide uh, earlier, uh, does does mention the use of that. Uh, glucose oxidase, uh, glucose and sodium azide, and, and, and that is very effective. Believe it or not, I, I actually uh, um, was, was introduced to that methodology many years ago uh, when I was at Genentech uh, working in the path lab there. So um, uh, it did work very well for them, and, and uh, I found that it, it to be a very superior methodology and gentle over something such as hydrogen peroxide. Okay, great. And the last question is, uh, how do I quench endogenous peroxidase from fragile membrane markers such as CD4 or CD8? Yeah, uh, some of those membrane markers are particularly uh, susceptible uh, to treatments such as H2O2. Uh, couple of suggestions. One, uh, you could use a very diluted solution of H2O2 and simply let the reaction run longer, say 30 minutes or even longer with say 0.1% H2O2. You could try that. Uh, if you do see a diminution in staining there or, or a lack of staining, uh, you could try one of the alternative methods that we, we've described here in a couple of those publications I showed earlier on. Um, alternatively, you could consider using a different enzyme-based system, such as alkaline phosphatase, so you don't have to quench endogenous peroxidase. Or, indeed, some other investigators have actually 
it's on the incubation with the primary and then uh, quench for H2O2 after that incubation with the primary um, to try and avoid that that lack or, or, or destruction, if you will, of that target antigen. So, so there's a couple of options there for those investigators struggling with, with that application. All right, thank you, Craig. At this point, our time is up, uh, but thank you for joining us for this webinar. Please uh, come back for our next webinar on IC and IF workflows. If you did not join at the beginning, we will send you all the entire recording of the webinar through email. Uh, at this point, we will close the webinar and hopefully uh, come back for the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.